ഹിക്കും <laughs> قالوا اقررنا قال فاشهدوا وانا معكم من الشاهدين فمن تولى بعد ذلك فاولئك هم الفاسقون افغير دين الله يبغون افغير دين الله يبغون وله اسلم മൂസ <laughs> മുസ്ലിമൂന ومن يبتغي غير الإسلام دينا فلن يقبل منه وهو في الآخرة من الخاسرين كيف يهد الله قوما كفروا بعد إيمانهم وشهدوا أن الرسول حق وجاهم البينات والله لا يهد الله قوم الظالمين اولئك جزاؤهم ان عليهم لعنة الله والملائكة والناس اجمعين خالدين فيها لا يخفف عنهم العذاب ولا هم ينظرون ഫുറുഹീം <laughs> ഫലൈക്കലഹും <laughs> Today I propose to finish this Ruku, whether I'll be able to do it or not is another question. But with this intention I have started and that is why I have recited the whole of the Ruku. we have already covered the first verse which is which begins with is akhad allah wa misaq nabiyina so i'll uh, read the translation from the second one faman tawalla ba'da dhalika fa ulaika humul fasiqun this also we have covered i think yes starting from afa ghayra din allah yabghuna wa lahu aslama man fi samawati wal ard do they seek a religion 
other than Allah's, while to them submits whosoever, while to him submits whosoever is in the heavens and the earth, willingly or unwillingly, and to him shall they all be returned. Say, we believe in Allah and in that which has been revealed to us and that which was revealed to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the, uh, and, uh, the tribes and in that which was given to Moses and Jesus and other prophets from their Lord we make no distinction between any of them and to him we submit. And whoso seeks a religion other than Islam, it shall not be accepted of him, and in the hereafter he shall be among the losers. How shall Allah guide a people who have disbelieved after believing and who had borne witness that the messenger was true and to whom clear proofs had come and Allah guides not the wrongdoing people. As for such, the reward is that, it, it, the reward is that on them shall be the curse of Allah and of angels and of men altogether. They shall abide therein under their punishment shall not be lightened, nor shall they be reprieved. Except those who repent thereafter and amend, and surely Allah is most forgiving, merciful. Surely those who disbelieve after they have believed and then increase in disbelief, their repentance shall not be accepted, and these are they who have gone astray. As for those who have disbelieved and die while they are disbelievers, there shall not be accepted from any one of them even the earth full of gold, though he, though he offers it as ransom. It is these for whom shall be a grievous punishment and they shall have no helpers. Yesterday, while we were discussing the first verse, the verse mentioning the covenant, I uh, read from some criticism of Vary. And I took that criticism up and I was uh, analyzing it and discussing it when the time ended. And I said, inshallah, tomorrow I would take up from where I have left. But later on, I thought, having read some other criticisms of the same ruku by Vary, that we should better take that up together in the end of uh, my commentary. First, we'll uh, go through the whole ruku finish the commentary, then we'll turn to various uh, objections and criticism and take them up one after the other to the finish. So that is why I have changed this, edit, uh, this, this uh, approach and uh, mm -hmm. so we'll begin without any mention of what we were discussing yesterday. فَغَيْرَ دِينِ اللَّهِ يَبْغُونَ وَلَهُ أَسْلَمَا مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ Literally, it, I have already translated it. Afaghera din illahi yabghuna walahu aslama man fi samawati wallah. How can they seek a path other than the path of Allah? Walahu aslama man fi samawati wallah while to him have submitted whosoever is in the heavens and in the earth. Tongva karhan, willy-nilly, willingly with option or through compulsion, unwillingly. 
व इलेह यूर जाऊन एंड टू हिम विल यू बी रिटर्न और दे विल दे बी रिटर्न वट इज़ द कनेक्शन बिटवीन अफा दीन अफा गैर दीन या बूना वलह असलमा वट इट मीन्स दिस इज़ टू बी एक्सप्लेन फर्स्ट दीन मे मीन टू थिंग्स दैट रिलीजन विच हैज़ बीन रिवील्ड बाई गॉड और एनी खॉर्स विच लीड्स टू गॉड so it is in this wider uh, perspective that this verse is discussing this subject it says walahu aslama min fi samawat wa la you can look back at nature you can find out and gain your lessons from what nature reveals to you that no one is free everyone willy nilly has to submit and there are two types of uh, of submissions during our study of the nature those submissions which are born out of wisdom experience and thereby which are not compulsory but uh, they are they lie in the region of options and those compulsions in which you have no choice whatsoever so to conceive man to be totally free or anything in the world to be to be at liberty to do whatever that thing may please is is wrong in fact god is pointing out that looking at nature you will discover that you are compelled to respect the laws of nature and you can't change them la tabdeel ale kalimat illa this is one of the meanings that laws of nature have to be respected otherwise you will you cannot draw any benefit from nature and to respect means submission first you accept the law submit to the law then you can make progress then you can turn them to your advantage but not without it and even if you want to defy a law you cannot now the modern sciences are built on the study of nature even the older sciences were an attempt to study the nature and to be built on the findings of their study but of course man has been making mistakes and still today man is making mistakes but generally speaking we can say we are in a better position today to study nature and to draw our lessons and to carve a path with the help of that study which would make our life easier more comfortable and uh, more pleasurable but nowhere can we defy the law without punishment and we can't change anything man is so helpless that he can't even change the minutest law of physics or chemistry if gravity is is one is one example gravitational pull he can study it from different angles and form different conclusions of course to the degree that he is right in his conclusion he can benefit from that study but he can't change the law whatever he may do he is compelled to follow this law and uh, with the help of its uh, relationship to other laws his study would become more complex until he can find some ways of benefiting from this law but he can never change any law if a certain chemical has an affinity for another chemical that would remain so no one on earth can ever change it but he'll follow the course which nature's nature uh, uh lays open for him and so through cautious steps would try to avoid clash with nature this is science this is uh, progress and this is advancement you understand your path and the hurdles and the difficulties and previously you have been stumbling over this and that and suffering 
So the ultimate in success and ultimate in wisdom is to know what nature desires of you, what nature wants of you, and never to come into clash with it. Carve a meandering path so that you never let your foot strike against an obstacle. By obstacle, what is understood is nature has projected something there. In ordinary life, perhaps you can pick a stone and remove its position. But the nature cannot be changed like this. If there is a jetty somewhere, you have to either bypass it or learn the manner to climb it or, or climb over it. But you can't change it. You can't change the place. This is the meaning of this verse and this is the meaning of La Mubaddil Ali Kalimatillahi. Kalimat means words of God and this is nature. According to the Holy Quran, the word of God becomes law. And that law cannot be defied, cannot be changed without punishment. And it cannot be changed anyway, but cannot be defied without punishment. So it says, after having studied the law, you, your wisdom develops. And out of that wisdom, you optionally, willingly cooperate with it. And sometimes you don't like it, but you have to cooperate anyway. So why are you running away from the law of religion? That again is the word of God. Although option is given to you here, yet uh, that option is in a way similar to the options to an uneducated man in his early history. He was also given option either to burn himself with fire or to turn it to better usage by cooking things and so on and so forth. So if you study the progress of mankind and, and, and civilization and everything man has learned through experience, you will always find him to be facing two options, either to confront nature or to submit to it. And all the progress is uh, the direct result of submission. So when you defy the laws of religion and don't learn your lessons from your experiences of this world, then you are bound to destroy yourself or come to some harm. Now this is what happens sometimes slowly in a longer period where one generation cannot positively put its finger to what has become, become wrong by the defiance of nature, the, the defiance of word of God. Now the moral education, for instance, is a very important part of the religious teachings. All religions lay special emphasis on moral teachings. And man has been defying. Today, the, these moral teachings are openly defied. And they say, no harm has come to us, look. We do this. And we, uh, we, we just transgress grass in every direction. And there we are. But some harms are cumulative. They take time to develop. The society becomes more and more restless. The people think they can draw pleasure by playing foul with the, religion, with the laws of morality and laws of religion. And ultimately they would emerge a better, more satisfied people or a more satisfied society. But in the end it would appear that it is all a false notion, it is a misconception. You cannot forcibly draw pleasure by avoiding the laws of nature without causing some pain somewhere. So this is a balance which you can never disturb. If somebody likes some girl, her beauty, her charms, and defying the laws of religion wants to appropriate her and enjoy her, he may perhaps. So also the girl can. But this society as a whole would always create problems and sufferings around. Sometimes sufferings in the family to which 
both these parties belong. Sometimes suffering to, to others who also wanted to have access to such people and such persons. And uh, sometimes as a whole by, in, by promoting this tendency you begin to disintegrate the family lives. Now, it is that point which I, 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 which I raised in the, in the first place, that sometimes you don't witness and immediately observe the damage done, because it takes time. It gradually appears. Ultimately, such promiscuous societies end up in broken homes. So you have to pay your, your price for, for permissiveness. And that price is also in, 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 in terms of losing pleasure and satisfaction and content. The less security there is for homes in a society, less contented that society would be. This is a law of nature which you cannot change. There will be less security as well. So you can only enjoy an individual selfish life for a while but again you will end up into nothingness. This break of family system, this break of uh, respect for mutual uh, rights of possession always ends up in individualization of a character, of a type which ultimately disintegrates the society by damaging the bonding points, by damaging the coherent forces. So man no longer lives together as a social animal, although in a general way of speaking he is still a part of the society. So in such advanced countries where permissiveness, I am just quoting one example of defiance of religion. There are so many. In fact, in every case you can develop this argument and analyze the situation to the result that man has paid his price. You can of course pick the fire into your own, in your own hands, but at some price, not without it. So laws of religion can also be broken, but you have to pay the price. And the cumulative price ultimately becomes unbearable. And it begins to accumulate in so many ways. So the developed societies, you would notice, the so-called highly advanced societies, which have uh, only one central uh, definition of being declared to be advanced. More permissive they are, more advanced they are. Otherwise they are backwards. So this permissiveness ultimately breaks down the family relationship, brother-sister love, father-daughter love, mother-son love, Friendships, they're all old concepts. Like uh, Ghalib has said, Agle ke hain ye log kuch na kaho. In such societies, when you start speaking of moral values, ethical values, religious laws, they say they belong to an older age. Forget about them, let them talk. It's just Chima Sahib, you know, that's his view. <laughs> and he belongs to the past. He is no longer our future. They say that, but more individual they become, more less protected their future becomes. They are, you know, they are liberating or emancipating themselves from a, from a past of ties which binds them, which uh, keeps them limited, uh, gives them limited scope of action and movement. And yet in the end they find themselves solitary, miserable figures, who have no children to look after, no friends to pay them visits, more and more uh, governmental controlled and organized homes come to be born and uh, it becomes a major economic problem too. How to keep such people happy who have no family to look after? I have sometimes uh, had the occasion of uh, in uh, directly questioning these people, I mean, ask, uh, finding out from them how they feel and what's happening to them. During my, particularly during my tour of 1978, I had a big opportunity of uh, sampling 
the such cases from very close observation and contact in America, in Europe, wherever I went, I had that contact established. And I was shocked to learn that they were very, very unhappy with them. They enjoyed drinking, they enjoyed, of course, uh, free relationship. But that was just a transient phase which ultimately ended up in misery and gradually they found that they had uh, no one to look after. They could trust no one. No one could trust them. And uh, this society ultimately becomes unbearable. So it further gives birth to movements which are movements of defiance but not ag particularly against the disease but against the outcome of disease. So they remain permissive. Not that they reconsider their way of life and re-examine their philosophy but they react against that society which they, ha they have inherited. They don't know what is hurting them. So they say, all right, this society is all hocus-pocus, nonsense, hypocritical. Let's turn hippies, let's turn to drugs, let's escape into cults. So all these things are born. In the name of freedom, you bind yourself into ch in chains of a different nature, which are hurting, which bring no satisfaction. But the f <coughs> that is willy-nilly. You can't escape. If you try to defy, you will never gain liberty. Liberty from one place, one, one area, and entanglement into another, and uh, limitation of, 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 of choices and scope in another area. So man is so, so powerless, powerless before God and before the forces of nature and before the laws of religion and morality. He has no choice, in fact. This is the verse which speaks of this, that you can't run away. It's impossible. So why not submit? With the submission, you will gain something which you can never gain by defiance. Your players will, re will remain in some total the same. Religion never deprives society of player as such. Only it uh, modifies players, develops tastes, and gives you more refined and acquired tastes, and stops you from short-circuiting and uh, grabbing player as if it was anybody's game. It renounces the, renounces the principle of might is right. Knowing that you could grab something, you desist from doing it. These are the laws of religion which you call, you can call ethical or moral laws. And God tells us that having followed this course, adopting this course willingly, not only that you will not be a loser in, some to, in the totality of social players, but you will gain something which you could never experience otherwise, content of heart which is so complete and which has no hangovers and uh, a player which for which you don't have to pay prices which returns itself to you, comes back to you by way of pleasure. Ilahi yurjaun is the ending of this verse. To return to God is never a bitter experience if you are on the right side of God. It can become a very bitter experience if you are on the wrong side of, the, of God. So this is what this verse is teaching us. It's a deep lesson in wisdom. And the one which generally societies ignore and pay heavy prices for that. So there are two ways of uh, fashioning your way of life. By submission to the laws of nature as you know already now and by submitting to the laws of religion, which again are from the same God. There is no division between nature and, and religion. But they are orders or instructions are ap applicable to a different area, 
uh, than the ordinary um, laws of nature. So this is what happens, but ultimately in both cases. In the end, you must return to, to your Lord. That is to say, you will be ultimately dispossessed of all your powers and all your choices. This is again a law of nature which no one can ever change. You begin with weakness, then you get strength, then you, you become powerful and have choices. Then the choices are gradually taken away from you. This is the subject which will be further developed as you proceed along and it will be clarified later on. But this is a point which uh, again has to be further clarified. Child is born weak with very little options and choices. Whatever he, uh, uh, he can earn for himself is with the help of those who love him. Otherwise, he is a total, totally incapable of survival thing, much weaker than many other animals born who immediately come to some sort of independence. But then when he grows further, more choices are offered him along with the strength. So strength it is which guides, uh, uh, which results in choices. Without strength, you can't have choices. This is also a very important principle to be borne in mind. So what, what is the difference between a child having no choices and an adult having choices? The only difference is that of strength. So strength makes, makes you proud. Strength gives you choices and then you think that you are at liberty to do whatever you please. Power it is which makes you ignorant and compels you to defy the laws of God, laws of, of nature sometimes, laws of, of, of religion in general. And uh, it is the pride of strength which compels you to take wrong choices because you have options available. You say, all right, I'm too powerful, I can do this. Nobody can stop me. But God says you forget your, the full course. You have not yet fully traveled. You are going to go full circle. Remember this. A time is going to come when this strength will be withdrawn from you, gradually. Whomever we decide to give long life, normal span of life, he would notice that the strength is gradually withdrawn from him and he is left helpless. And with helplessness comes loss of choices and rigidness and ultimately nothingness. You want things you can't do. And there you will find yourself no helper. Because you have defied God, so God's laws would defy you. And you end up a solitary life which we witness in a small way in the homes of the developed nations. You'll be surprised to learn that in America, the, 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 there is not only the problem of homes, there is also the problem of madness. <coughs> in such highly developed society, where they claim we have means to have any happiness and pleasure, more than any place in the world, why should they end up mad? More so, than in any other nation. If you study the comparative figures, you'll be surprised and flabbergasted, in fact, you'll be shocked to learn that per capita, per, uh, in, in, in ratio to number of society and the numbers of madness, America leads the figures of the world by large margin, by many necks, many lengths, in fact. And the problem there is not only to find homes for the aged who are rejected by the society, but to find homes for the mad people. I have uh, uh, studied a book entitled Mind Control. It gives all the facts and figures on this, uh, in this area. 
And uh, it's a well-documented book written by some great scholars who have taken pain to study all these things. So this book reveals those facts and uh, I was deeply shocked to have come across them. It says that uh, all the madhouses in America are full to the brim. Then they started shifting the mad people to other homes at the expense of those who needed those homes because they could not leave their mads free in the society to do whatever they please. And then other uh, shelters were sought until there was completely, totally exhausted, they were exhausted. And now they are such mad people who are declared mad, but for them you can't have any place. And uh, this problem is growing with the passage of time and the tendencies towards getting cheap player is the major cause. This is the final analysis of that book. This is the cause which ultimately led to the drug. It is the drug which ultimately led to more madness and more madness required more drugs and more potent drugs and more potent drugs caused greater madness in those who were not yet mad but they wanted a kick, greater kick out of the more potent drugs. So all this is a vicious circle. Only in the final analysis, it's an attempt to defy the laws of God and laws of nature. So it says, Will they seek a path, a way of life, other than that of God? Other than that which God has given or prescribed for them? Or other than the one which leads to God? To God you will be led willy-nilly, ultimately. But it's up to you to make your choice, to, to be led to God willingly or to be led to God unwillingly. If you stand on the wrong side of religion, then you would abhor the idea of meeting God. Because if you have been defying the orders of your parents and you have been living a life which uh, they abhor, it is impossible for you to face them. So you avoid, so people run away, become truants, run away from houses and so on, because they no longer live in a place where they are misfits, because they don't agree with the atmosphere, with the, with the discipline of that, that place, and those who are in control would not like their presence, like they would like their presence to be there. This is a problem. So this is hell. The hell which you will find mentioned elsewhere later on is this. And the heaven mentioned is also this. You have lived a life of cooperation with God and God's laws and you are attuned more and more to the ways of God. But here you, you do it with not a deeper perception. But you know, this is what you have begun to like. You know you are fully satisfied with this. And you look forward to more of it. When you die, because your perceptions will be sharpened, you will come closer to that direction which you are already taking, already taken in this world then you will draw the pleasure of being close to what you de always desired. And if you have been going the wrong way, you, the effect of your jaun will also be on you. You can't escape it. So what would happen, it, happen would be, you have been truant all through your life. Ultimately you find no way, you are weakened, you have no strength, no choice left, you have to return to, to the origin to God, but you are not used to it. So a presence which you have been avoiding all your life, with which you are not familiar, which, which is alien to your thinking and your tastes, that becomes a punishment. So later on, but uh, uh, in, in the background, I, why I developed it, you will understand some other very strong censures and very strong warnings and very uh, horrible pictures of hell which have been painted.
So there one thinks, if he doesn't understand this background, one thinks that God is very cruel for doing a small crime here and he is he's so harsh in his punishment and he is so unforgiving. While if you understand this problem, this background, how the hell is created and how the heaven is made, then you know that it is you who can be cruel to yourself and it is you who can be kind to yourself. Look at those nations who are suffering today in the world as third world people. They of course blame the West for, mis for, for exploiting them. But they are to blame themselves. In the past when the West cooperated with the laws of nature, they tried to defy the laws of nature. They wanted to draw comfort from indolence, from inactivity from without finding how the nature behaves to get comfort out of uh, whatever, was, whatever was available to them. So the West at that period of time was busy putting them, themselves to great troubles. Apparently they saw nothing ahead but what they were committed to was a study of nature and knowing where the nature stands so that we can never cross our path, cross our path with nature and mend our way according to the walls created by the way of laws of nature. So they did that and this is their heaven. And there is a hell created in Africa, in, in Asia, in Pakistan, in India, in other third world countries. And there is, is a heaven, comparative heaven of course, but a heaven created in the West to which the Eastern country, people are running. No, there is another type of hell also created here. This is what they don't see. This is what the Holy Quran is pointing out. This is the meaning of a one-eyed Dajjal. An antichrist who would have only one eye. That eye would be very sharp in its vision. It would be very penetrating. But the other eye would be completely blind. So, you see the, a place where both hell and heaven exist together in the same atmosphere but of a different type and these wavelengths do not disturb each other. When the one verse of the Holy Quran was revealed that the heaven is so big and so its expanse is so large that arzu has samawate wala Arzu has samawate wala. Samawato? Yes. Oh, yes, that's right. Arzu has samawato wala. Its expanse covers the expanse of the whole universe. The com companions of the holy founder of Islam, who, of course, were not uh, as advanced naturally as Ahazra Sallallahu had become through the teachings of God. They, in their ignorance, asked, How can it be possible, O Prophet of Allah, that the heaven covers the whole universe? Where would the hell be then? Where will it be created? Look at the answer. Imagine how advanced Ahazra had become by having learned things from God. He said, In the same space, in the same place, Hell and heaven would live together, yet separate from each other. And there is something you can't conceive, you can't understand. So a sort of living together of hell and heaven can be witnessed both in the East and in the West. There are areas in the East where the human suffering is immense. But yet you will find people there with complete content of heart and complete satisfaction because they have learned and built how to uh, and learned how to build a heaven for themselves and then built it so in a manner of speaking they are living in a hell in a manner of speaking they are living in heaven and they coexist in the west there is also a hell in this heaven which they know is burning their hearts they are dissatisfied with with what they have achieved because they still can't change the constant, constant created by God. And uh, 
they have to gain something from this hand and lose it from the other. And you say, an exchange of commodities, that is all they can do, nothing more. So God has given us immense wisdom in this verse. If we understand the message, it's the most beautiful thing, one of the most beautiful messages of the Holy Quran. Will they, how could they, that is the meaning, seek a path other than the path of Allah? They know it. In the laws of nature, everything has to submit and has submitted to the will of God willy-nilly, out of compulsion or out of choice. And they know ultimately they must return to the source. Everything must return to the source, making full circle. You too. So how can you escape? قُلْ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْنَا وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَىٰ إِبْرَهِيمَ وَإِسْمَئِلَ وَإِسْحَاقُ وَيَعْقُوبُ Having established the beauty of, of unity, the concept and the doctrine of unity of God, and having demonstrated it in so many terms, by pointing out to the unity in nature, in laws, in everything, now having delivered this message completely, comprehensively, it says, Qul, say, O Prophet, tell others, O Prophet, now, you have made the thing very clear to them, Amanna billahi wa ma unzil alayna. We believe in Allah and we believe in what has been revealed to us, but not at the expense of what has been revealed earlier to others, because there is no division in either God or in his messages. As such, when we say we believe in Prophet Muhammad and what has been revealed to him, we have to accept also, we have to confess at the same time and profess that we believe in all that has been revealed before him. Otherwise, our claim will be false. We'll be dividing between one messenger of God and other messenger of God and that will not be submission. You can't divide between laws of nature and laws of nature. If you submit to one law, you have to submit to the other. Otherwise, you'll be caught on the wrong foot, uh, if not here, in, in, in another place. So this is the meaning. The same subject is being discussed and elaborated in the world of religion. It says, Ma'unzila alayna wa ma'unzila ala Ibrahim wa Ismaila wa Ishaqa wa Yaquba. We believe in what was revealed to Abraham, to Ishmael, to Isaac, to Jacob, well, Asbate, and all others. Asbat, in fact, applies to the generations. Those uh, who follow some, uh, having their, being the progeny of some older generation, uh, in blood or uh, in thought and views as well. So this is a very wide word of application. So what it means is that to similar people like J Jacob, like Ishmael, Is 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 like Isaac and so on and so forth, people like them have also been given, we don't know their names. We don't know when God spoke to someone, but in principle we agree. So the, what is discussed here, remember this, is not a detailed teaching at all. What is discussed here is a principle that God is common to all. God has shown his path to all mankind at various stages of history, in every geographical region, to every nation. And we submit to this principle, not knowing their teaching. This is the point, because if the teaching was, was, was in question, was, was the, the subject of discussion, then asbat could not have been mentioned, because we don't know the teachings of hundreds or thousands of prophets, and we never heard of them, but in principle we agree that God did speak to them, and God did deliver his message, whatever it was. وَمَا أُوتِيَ مُوسَى وَإِيسَى وَالنَّبِيُّونَ and whatever was given to Moses and to Jesus 
and prophets generally, we all agree, la nufarriqu bayna ahadim minhum, we do not discriminate and differentiate between any of them. Wa nahnu lahu muslimun. This word lahu muslimun is very, very beautiful declaration here which rounds up the whole thing, whole subject. Why do we do, do this? Because we have understood the meaning of Islam. From the previous statement and many other statements, the meaning of Islam has become very clear to us. Islam only means submission to Allah, not to human beings. So if you submit to him, then you have to submit to those who are sent by him. This is the principle. So we have no direct relation and we don't have to have any direct relation or knowledge of them. So in general, our faith is this, that the in the final analysis, the ultimate of wisdom is to submit to God. In nature, in religion, whatever comes from God, it is for you to submit. If you understand that message, then you can declare, I am a Muslim. And Lahu Muslimun clarifies the Holy Soul. We believe in them, but we are not Muslimun to them. This is the point which is made here, very clear by the Holy Quran. We submit not to them to whom, in whom we believe. We submit to him who has sent them. So this is the ultimate of the unity. The most wonderful concept of unity of God, which encompasses all religious movements. Then the question wouldn't arise, why this religion, why not that religion? The only question you will have to address would be, whatever is said to you and, and conveyed to you, is it from God or not? If you know it is from God, then you have to accept it, whatever the name be. It is this Islam which is now mentioned here. Islam having fully defined, whoever now turns away and looks elsewhere from Islam as has as been defied, defined as dina, as a course, as a path, as a religion. For It will not be accepted. Now, what is Islam other than, than, than this? What faith could be other than this Islam? Any faith which will discriminate and differentiate and overemphasize the importance of someone to the degree that having accepted him, we don't have to accept others, even be they from God. This is what is uh, condemned as faith other than Islam, because this is exactly this is the definition of Islam given to us in the earlier verse. So some Muslims unnecessarily try to uh, limit the meaning of al-Islam as mentioned here. But their purpose is solved anyway without uh, declaring it to be al-Islam as the deen revealed to Allah They don't have to do it because ultimately it amounts to the same thing. If you submit to the principle of the true faith being that faith which looks at God at the center and accepts people through him. Never accept God through people in that sense. Because Moses gives us that God, we must accept that God. Because Jesus doesn't give us that God, so we, will, we must reject. This is the wrong attitude, which is not Islam. And Gharal Islam refers to this attitude. So once you acquire and stick to this healthy principle, of always looking at the source, then you cannot miss whatever religion is revealed, then the final and ultimate expression of Islam would of course be the, the religion which is teaching us all this wisdom and beautiful things. How can you remain a true Muslim being a Christian 
by defying and rejecting Ahadra Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the founder of Islam, having understood all this. So one thing would lead to another and ultimately you have to end up in the final consummate expression of God's will. And uh, whatever you do, wherever you have been before, you will count it as among the Muslims. So also, as long as you have not heard of Islam, in this sense that the religion, uh, in, the, in the sense that the religion which was revealed to Ahadur Sallallahu If you don't hear of him, if you don't know of his message, but you stick to Islam in principle, even then that religion will be acceptable. This verse doesn't rule out that possibility because there is another verse, not one, many other verses, which make it very clear that as long as you are honest and you are Muslim in spirit under this principle, as long as you, to, you stick with integrity and honesty in whatever you believe to be the message of God, if you have not heard of Islam as the final message, if you have not heard of other religions as other messages and you don't submit to them, still you are safe. God will not question you because then you will still be found on Islam, although less developed Islam. Slightly different but in principle the same. So there is no contradiction between this declaration and other such declarations which uh, some of them I have already discussed previously, but some would come later on. Now, we turn to the third verse. Uh, Why does it say fil minal khasirin? It means in the hereafter he will be among the losers. Will such people not be the losers here in this world and only wait to, to suffer the loss after they, they, they are resurrected in a different world? Is that the meaning of this verse? No. Because other verses very clearly declare that those who are not Muslims, who do not submit to the will of God, they are losers here in this world too. So, only speaks of his own perspective. Many a time it happens and it's a commonplace experience that although you are a loser, you don't know that you are a loser. So, has one message that they may live uh, you know, in the make-believe that they are against everything by whatever course they are following, which is other than the one described, but they will always end up. So, akhira here can have two meanings, the life to come and the end of every life here, in every effort and every pursuit. So, it says that they have experiences, twice bitter experiences, they will go on following a course which is against these principles described here and they, would, they may not think that they are the losers. But ultimately in the end of every project, in the end of every pursuit, they, they will discover themselves to be the losers. And the second point is that here in this world they may die under the misconception and conceit that they are all right, they have everything to gain, nothing to lose. But when they uh, they are reborn after, de after death, then they will know that uh, they had no gain, everything uh, was lost and uh, they ended up empty-handed. Kafa yahdillahu qawman kafaru baada imanihim wa shahidu anna rasoola haqqun wa jaahum al bayyanatu wallahu la yahdil qawman zalimeen this says, Kefa yahdillahu qawman kafaru baada imanihim. Now this is a very important continuation of the same subject, though apparently it seems to 
discuss something else. I have already explained that by my yaptare gairal islam e deena, Islam here refers to this principle which has been explained elaborately before. Now it says, Kafa yahdillahu qawman kafaru bada imanahim wa shahidu anna rasul haqqun. How can God guide? How can God guide such people who have disbelieved despite their faith? Here it doesn't, it's not speaking of, of, of uh, apostasy at all. This verse is not related to apostasy as some Muslim scholars would have it. It's a completely different subject. It means there are people who shahidu anna rasul haqqun. They know it. And knowing it, they don't accept him. Because of some other interests, because of their weakened faith in God, in fact. Because they take religion too lightly. Because the world around them is more powerful and more attractive to them. So there are people who know the truth of the Prophet and yet reject him. This is the other path which has been mentioned as a rejectable path. My Islam This is the path or the deen which will not be accepted because there will be a contradiction within you. You have known the truth and yet you reject. Now this also connects with the earlier Mubahala challenge. We have gone so far away apparently from that incident where Mubahala challenge was uh, thrown to, presented to the opponents, yet the Holy Quran keeps returning to the same subject and connects them up the earlier statements with the second, following statements. Why was Mubahala uh, ch challenge given to those visitors from Najran who had long discussions with Ahadur Sallallahu They were Christian leaders and a party from among them which was quite influential and knowledgeable and highly placed. They had a long discussion of many days on the relative merits of Islam and Christianity with Ahadur Sallallahu In the end, God told Ahadur Sallallahu to throw a challenge of Mubahala to them because God knew that in their hearts they were convinced and they were yet defying out of, you know, shame or whatever, you know, personal ego or of their interest back home and so many things, all their leadership would have been destroyed. So whatever the reasons, they preferred the world, the worldly matters over religion. They preferred their own interests to uncommitted submission to the will of God. So having reached that stage, God said, now throw them the challenge of Mubahala. Invite them to a spiritual bout. And the condition would only be this, that each party should curse whoever is the liar in the sight of Allah. Now, if that statement of God was not correct, that inside they had discovered the truth of Rasulullah and Islam, it was just you know, an easy thing, an ordinary thing for them to accept this challenge, because then they would have known, of course, they were right. They never indulge in falsehood. Whatever they believed was uh, out of conviction. And uh, they could have said, yes, of course, go ahead. You invoke the curse of God on, on the liar and we invoke the curse of God and let Allah, be, Allah decide it. Now history tells us and all the Orientalists agree to this, that they did not accept this challenge. Why not? That shows that there can be people who knowing the truth, yet do not accept it. For them there is no guidance. Because if in our own language we also say that Sutte hai nu te jagala ho, jaga sakda hai koi, jage nu koi jaga sakda. If somebody is asleep, you can wake him up. But if he is awake, you can't wake him up. <laughs> do whatever you may please. 
we had sometimes, you know, very interesting experiences uh, with such children. There was a nephew of ours who was a past master in the art of imitating that he was asleep. So when we tried to wake him up, do whatever we may, he would not wake up. Even he was strong enough to withstand the pressures of you know, what you call chutki, you know, this <laughs> twisting of muscles and this and that. He just would not wake up. So ultimately, I thought of a, of a way of defeating him. He was very clever, but also simple in a way. So while he was asleep, mock asleep in this way, I discussed it with uh, my cousin, whose real nephew he was. He was not a real nephew of mine, but a cousin's son. So we started talking to each other of having arranged this. I said, look here, he's asleep perhaps. You, you, you are wrong that he's not asleep. But there is one sign of deep sleep that sometimes only one eye starts twinkling, the other remains stay put. And there he was, you know, twinkling. <laughs> <laughs> the other was closed. So later on, we developed this theme further, and we started talking about one one leg raised straight up, the other lying, uh, and the other arm on the, on the other other side, you know, also shot, shooting up in the air, and that is what he started doing. <laughs> so you can't wake up who is already awake. So when say kafa yahdil it doesn't mean that uh, they are condemned by God. It means they have condemned themselves to a position from which they can never be awakened because they are making themselves believe that they, they, they are right. They know they are wrong, making others believe that they are right. So how can they be guided? Kafa yadillah qawman kafaru bada imanim. It's not a question of apostasy which is discussed. This is the situation in relation to the early Mubahala challenge. They know, they stand witness to the fact that this messenger of God is true. And many manifest signs have come to them. The matter is now resolved completely. What Allah means by this? It says, those who transgress against themselves who have decided to be cruel to themselves. Allah never guides them because it's up to them then. They have made a choice. Ulaika jazaohum anna alayhim lanat allahe wal malaikat wal nasi ajma'een. These are the people whose uh, ultimate destiny, whose end or whose reward, jaza is literally reward, is that anna alayhim lanat allahi on them would be the curse of Allah wal malaika and that of angels wal nasi ajmain and that of all the people some scholars forcibly want to prove their own um, view not the view of Islam that punishment for apostasy is death and man is made responsible and is permitted to punish such people who apostate. Maulana Madhudi being one of those. And such people have the audacity to quote these two verses and draw this conclu distorted conclusion of their own mind from these verses, which is so straightforward. They say that God has said that Allah will not guide those people who have renegated, having once accepted Islam. And as such, it is not only the curse of Allah which will befall them. You also as human beings have a right to curse them, that is to say to kill them, to drag them in the streets, to punish them in any way you may please. This is the conclusion they draw by curse of people. While they forget that what is mentioned here is one nase ajma'een, the curse of the whole, all people. They say Ajmain relates to this group, not to Nas. They insist that Lana Tallahe wal Malaikate wal Nas, this is the meaning, Ajmain, Allah, angel, and people put together is Ajmain. Of course, that could be the rightful meaning. 
but when you say nas ajmain everybody understands from the holy quran's jargon that here it is the people who are referred to as in totality if it were not so it would have said instead of nas mu'minin curse of mu'minin because nas is is a non descript word it includes both uh, those who are disbelievers and those who are believers and dissenters and others everybody is included generally and roundly under the term annas so why should have god use the term nas instead of al mu'minin and what is the meaning of their wrath and their curse does it translate itself into a physical punishment or this is something else which is being described and then you again you say those who reject the truth knowing it are not cursed by people at all have you ever seen any people such people being cursed by the people all together you never come across this so there some meaning which we are missing some undertone which uh, we have not heard properly and to me it is quite clear the fact is that this attitude is always cursed and such people are a failure everywhere in life those people who begin to see the truth and do not have the courage or honesty to accept that truth and stand by that truth they live a life of uh, hypocrisy and such this policy is a failure everywhere in the world in politics in business in other places wherever you go you go you find they are cursed by nature as a whole by the laws of god by the angels who are instrumental in running those laws and by the people in general so it is not just the question of apostasy at all which is being discussed or otherwise this will be a relevant statement so this attitude is really a, an attitude of total failure whatever course you pursue remember this that you must always be true to yourself you must always have the courage to admit what is true this is what has destroyed politics in pakistan nowadays inside all these politicians know that to treat amadis like this is inhuman this is not permissible by any concept of democracy yet they only admit before you when you are discussing this in private they sympathize with you they say of course we know discuss this matter with any minister who comes here today nowadays this the minister is already present if anybody can have access to him you say look here i know it's all wrong but mullah what can we do you know we know it's false but we have to live with this falsehood so god says no you attempt to live with falsehood and you are bound to meet destruction curse of people means ultimately this policy this politics this business whatever it is is bound to come to a failure and that is the meaning of the curse of annas ajmain people as a whole react ultimately to reject this attitude and such people end up in failure now i think i'm sorry it's only two verses which i have been able to cover later on inshallah next week 